Good morning. Welcome to our webinar on our two-part system updates. I'm Janice Mason Kim, Head of Retirement Fund Consulting at ENG, and your host today. To my right is Shirley Bajna. She's our senior legal advisor at ENG. And to my left is a very uh, you've seen Leanne many times, but Leanne van Bake. She is the director of ICTS Legal Services. Uh, Leanne has been in the financial services industry for more than 25 years. Um, Leanne also represent, uh, represents an industry body at the FECA's Retirement Funds and Market Conducts Committee. Leanne regularly speaks on employee benefit topics at leading international and national conferences, as well as providing publications and articles on matters with a legal and regula regulatory focus. Leanne um, has trustee experience and is a principal officer of our fund. So we welcome Leanne today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we will be providing a recording of today's session uh, together with the PowerPoint slides, so that will be made available after today's session. On our agenda today is we're going to discuss two-part system updates, um, some upcoming changes to the Pension Fund Act, and then we'll end off with any questions that we receive throughout today's session. First off, just a reminder before we get into two parts is that we have the FECA Trustee Toolkit. Um, just a reminder to all the trustees that are listening today, uh, whether you're a, a board trustee or an alternate trustee, if you're appointed to your funds board before the 27th of September of last year, you are required to complete that toolkit by the 26th of March, 2024. However, if you are appointed as an alternate or a trustee to your board um, after the 27th of September last year, you have six months in which to complete that. We are urging trustees to please um, go in and complete those 11 modules as soon as possible. It does take around seven hours to complete in each 11 module, so please don't leave it to the last minute. Uh, we have seen and some trustees have complained about there being a lag in the system and the system could crash, so please do that as soon as possible. Once you've completed all 11 modules, uh, download your certificate. Please provide a copy of that certificate to your principal officer and fund consultant that are required to monitor the compliance of all trustees completing those toolkits. Then we can move on to the two part system updates. I'm <laughs> really late. <laughs> it's another two part system update. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe let's just talk about the timing of the two parts. So what is the effective date currently specified in legislation and could this change? So currently it's proposed that it will go ahead 1 September 2024. Whether it changes, we'll, we'll let Leanne give us some more updates on that and see what, what the possibilities of that. So if I stare into my crystal ball yet again on two parts, um, I think that's... Um, on this question, it's extremely hard to answer. And the reason for this, for this is this, is that come the end of March, um, our parliaments and all the committees, et cetera, disband for elections. And then we don't know who will come back into those committees, et cetera. So um, whether or not changes will be made to two part depends on who's in parliament. Right, and what their views are in relation to two. I have to say that um, unlike something like NHI, which you're not sure where the funding will come from, I think two parts um, government is likely to make money on it, um, you know, in relation to, for example, taxation, as opposed to costing a lot of money, except perhaps for SARS systems, etc. So I can't see that that would be a reason for pushing out one September. Um, but at the moment, we're working on the dates of 1 September. Sorry. So what we thought is that we would give you guys an idea of how legislation goes through Parliament, because we always say, oh, it's at the National Assembly or it's at the NCOP. So we um, asked Shirley if she would just give us a broad outline of that. Thanks, Leanne. So basically, the lawmaking process uh, in South Africa is that the introduction of the bill is presented to National Assembly. 
um, or the National Council of Provinces. The bill is then referred to the relevant committee. In this instance, it would be SCOF, so the Standing Committee of Finance, and published in the Government Gazette for public comment. Um, the bill is then debated um, at the committee, so here it would be SCOF and amended if required. The bill is then sent to the National Assembly for debate and voting. Um, it's sent to the NCOP for them to agree or to not agree. And then it goes to the president for signing. And then we have legislation in the act that's passed. So it's quite a process um, that it has to go through. And um, when we give you updates, we tell you where it is in this process. Look, um, money bills like the Revenue Laws Money Bill are slightly different, but it is basically a, a very similar process. Okay, so what we thought we'd do is we'd tell you what legislation we're waiting for in relation to two parts and where it is at the moment um, and what we're still expecting to see. So the first one is the big one, which is the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill. And those are all the two part changes to the Income Tax Act. Now, if you go onto the parliamentary monitoring site, it's got this very useful little diagram that you can find there. And here we see that um, the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill has gone through National Assembly, we know that. And the next step is the National Council of Provinces. After that, it will then, as Shirley was saying, it will then go through to the president for a set. So that one is a bit closer. Then we're also waiting for the Pension Funds Amendment Bill. Um, now this one, is slightly um, behind the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill. Um, and uh, here you can see it still needs to go to the National Assembly. So that is its next point. I heard, and I don't know if it's changed, but I've heard that it was going to go to the National Assembly on the 26th of March. Um, and uh, Parliament disbands on the 28th of March. So it's cutting it really fine on this one. Um, if uh, it doesn't go to the National Assembly on the 26th of March and it doesn't squeak in, then we're going to have to wait for all those committees to reconstitute before it can go through those committees. Then we've also got a Revenue Law's Second Amendment Bill. And that is making some technical changes to the um, Income Tax Act two parts provisions. Now this is causing uh, some degree of chaos and you will see that as I go through and as we go through the answers today, I'm gonna raise where it's uh, created some uncertainty in relation to two parts. So you will see that um, coming through as a theme. And then of course we were waiting for the FCA's communication about two-part rules. We're going to deal with that today in a little bit of detail because that communication has been issued. But just to mention that um, it was issued without consultation because it was felt to be urgent. Um, a communication is not law, so it is something that we can choose to follow or not. But of course we would want to follow it because um, when we submit our rules for registration, you know, we, we need to understand that we are putting forward what the ABCA wants. Um, but they did mention perhaps that they might um, look at issuing either a, an addition to this communication on issues the industry is asking questions on, because there's a lot of questions, or if there are that many questions, they might then withdraw it and reissue it. Okay, but we are going to have a look at this today. Um, so yeah, that was all I wanted to mention in relation to what we're expecting in relation to legislation. Um, Janice, back to you. Yeah, so maybe let's just talk about one of the important points to emphasize in communication to members about the two-part system. So, I mean, maybe let's unpack seating because uh, there's a lot of questions. Members, obviously, this is the biggest thing around two parts and having access to money early and how that's going to work. Um, but I mean, there's obviously limitations and rules around that. So maybe you can give us some insights into that here. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Janice. Um, just to mention that if there are questions, we will deal with them later. Um, those questions that we receive before the session will deal with while we're going through um, the questions and answers. Um, and then if there are questions um, that you guys want to put forward, please put it in the Q&A. We'll keep an eye on it, and then Janice will ask us all questions at the end. Um, so communication for two-part is perhaps one of the most important 
issues that we're dealing with. You know, when we looked at, for example, compulsory immunization or something like that, it was more around getting the legalities right. And um, whereas this is a this is really about communication. If we leave aside, you know, what NMG is is doing in relation to systems and channels and that sort of thing, this is the next big issue, right? So if we look at seeding, remember what seeding is? Seeding is the starting balance in your savings pot come one March, so one March, one September 2024, right? So what it means is that you look at everything that you have saved up. In the fund, come one September twenty twenty four. That sits in your vested in your vested pot, and then in terms of your seeding, what happens is we get an amount transferred from your vested pot into your savings pot. Now that amount is ten percent of your vested pot, capped at thirty thousand rand. I'm sure this is ringing bells for everybody. Right? This is what's happening in relation to seeding. But if you're looking at communication specifically. Right. At the moment, this is what members are interested in, right? And Janet, how many meetings have you been to with members where they haven't said to you, where am I getting the money? Exactly. I think this and I think this is what most funds and um and consultants and boards need to be focusing on. I think out of all the legislation that we've seen in the past, this would be the, the one that we need to drive communication the most. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of understanding um and what processes to be followed in order to access that saving spot. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. So that's why we've got it up front here. But of course, we don't want them to only focus on us, right? Okay. And we also want to, them to understand the risks and negatives around taking this money. And we're going to focus on that yes. later on. Okay, so if we look at seeding, um, some of the important points you need to put in your communication is that seeding is one score. Right? A lot of members think that they're going to get this every year. That is not the case. So we need to be very clear about this. The seeding happens once on the 1st of September, 2024 for your starting balance. And there is no more seeding after that. So we've got to be very clear on that. And then we need to um, make sure that members understand that the cap on this amount that they're going to get as a starting balance is 30,000 Rand. But for some members, they might not get 30,000. Okay, so if we do an example, say the members, the amount that they've saved up in the fund before 1 September is 400,000, right? That's in the investor pot. They then get 10% of that, 40,000, capped at 30,000 into their savings pot as a um, starting balance. So they will get 30,000. But say you have got a member who's only saved up 100,000. In this in retirement fund, so they're a new member, or whatever the case may be, their their ten percent is ten thousand rand. Okay, so they only get ten thousand rand as a starting balance going into their savings pot. So this is something that members also need to understand. Often members, and I'm sure Janice, you've run into this as you have showed you, which is, um, oh, I'm getting thirty thousand. Yes. Well, no, maybe not. It could be less than that, or, or it could be nothing at all. Yes, or um. I'm getting much more than 30,000, yes. you know. So and so told me that I'm getting, you know, 100,000 or whatever the case may be. Okay, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about this and we need to correct that in communication. Okay, and then um, if we can work, move on now, we know about seeding, right? And we understand what we need to communicate in relation to seeding. But what about savings with all benefits? Because this is what we were saying, right? Members are very focused on how much money they're going to get out of the fund. Now, if we look at a savings withdrawal benefits, um, and we need to get used to this wording, right? So this is what it's called. This is how SARS refers to it. This is how the ABCA refers to it. We're talking about the benefit that you're going to be able to take out of your savings part while you're still employed. Right? And that is your savings withdrawal benefit. So this is a new statutory benefit. You know, just like you've got a retirement benefit or withdrawal benefit or whatever it is, you now have a savings withdrawal benefit. Um, and the member can simply request this. So this is not something that has to go through the employer or the employer has to initiate. This is something the member requests themselves. And there's no decision that the trustees need to make. It happens automatically if you're entitled to the savings drop. Exactly. So 
that is the point that I'm making here, which is what Shirley's saying. She's saying, you must allow this as an employer. So it's not up to you as an employer to say, oh, well, we don't like these savings withdrawals. We're not going to allow it. But you have to allow it. You must allow it. Um, so um, this is obviously subject to all those little deduction rules that we're going to talk about in a minute. But um, it is not something you can decide, oh, I really don't want to have this benefit and I'm not going to allow it. Okay. Then um, you don't have to reason, right? So you don't have to say, I'm in financial distress. So, for example, some, um, some people are calling these benefits financial distress benefits or something like that. So understand why you would want to do that because you want to encourage members to only take it yes. if you're in financial distress. But it is slightly misleading in that you, you do not need to be in financial distress. You don't have to provide a reasoning right. uh, yeah, to the fund. So perhaps just do like that. And then um, it is only allowed once in a tax assessment year, not once annually, once in a tax assessment year. So you could take a savings withdrawal in January 2025 and then again in August 2025, as an example, because it's over two tax assessment years. All right, and then the other thing to note is that there is this minimum amount. So you have to have 2,000 Rand in your savings pot before you can take this amount. And that's important when we're talking about communication. This is important to tell members. Yeah, because if you have less than that amount, you actually can't take anything out through it. The other question that members often ask, well, um, how much can I take? Yeah. Right. So if they've got 20,000 rand sitting in their savings, well, they can take the whole lot of it. But they don't have to. And that's another thing that we need to tell members. You don't have to take this amount. It's just going to stay there. Don't worry. If you don't take it now, it'll still be available to you. Right. And I think that's very important to communicate. Especially up front coming once again. I think everybody's so concerned that there could be a change and they need to take access that money immediately. It's it's okay, you can wait. You don't exactly. have to do it on the first of September. You yeah. can wait for it to grow or in a point where you actually have financial distress that you require to take benefits out of the fund. Yeah. And I think that that's very important to point out to members so that they know that. Right? It's don't, you know, calm the panic, we could go, you yes. could wait. And then, of course, um, am I going the wrong way, Janice? <laughs> um, it's also um, the fact that this is going to be taxed marginal rates. And I think I know we're going to go unpack a lot of it a little bit later in terms of exiting and taxing, because I think there's a lot of confusion around what tax applies when and how and yeah. on what pots. So. And it is confusing. Yes, it is confusing. So you'll remember in our last two-part webinar, we put slides together and I would refer you to those slides and that recording again where we went through each of the benefits and we said how you see tax. We will do some of that again in this session just so you get an idea. But remember that whenever you take an amount out of your savings pot, okay, and you are not dead and you are not retiring, it's going to be taxed at a much more rate. So it's only once you get past retirement that you can take money out of your savings pot and it's not taxed at your okay. marginal rate. Tax rate. Yeah. So for savings, withdrawal benefits, withdrawal benefits, etc., you get an amount out of your savings pot, you're going to get taxed at your marginal rate. Okay. The tax mechanism for that is still a little bit up in the air. I saw that SARS issued their BRS, I think it was yesterday, um, in relation to tax directives and how we're going to... Um, manage savings withdrawal benefits, but at the moment it looks like it will be a tax application. Okay. So, and that seems to be what they're thinking for now. I suspect that in years to come we might have something smart now. Yes. Um, but at the moment, given the turnaround times, that's what SARS can manage. Okay, and then we've got a lot of new rules around savings withdrawal benefits. And we're going to deal with those today and they relate to deductions. So basically we're trying to protect deductions like divorce orders and maintenance orders, et cetera, from a member who wants to take a savings with all that. Yes. Right? We want to make sure we've got enough money for that divorce order um, if the member's re requested savings with all that. So this, again, is something to communicate. Yes. Right? And we don't want to communicate it in an extreme amount of detail because these rules are very complicated, but we do want to let them know we are going to have to ask you questions about divorce orders and maintenance orders and other things like that. Um, so 
um, that might um, derail the process a little bit and uh, or some unnecessary delays. And it derail is perhaps a strong word. It might divert it into a different channel, yes. which um, Janice Ewan is going to talk about later. Okay, so there's lots to communicate on savings withdrawal benefits, and we know that. Um, so Janice. Janice, perhaps um, we can just move on to um, how are we going to notify um, NMG as the administrator as it's not going through the employer yes. as an example? 100%. What are you planning? So what we're planning, and I think to Leanne's point, planning and, and a lot of it is in testing phase at the moment. So I think our main avenue that we'd want members to communicate uh, with us around savings withdrawal would be through our WhatsApp um, facility. So that's in design at the moment. What's nice about the WhatsApp is that one members can request a balance from on their savings pot. So before members even try and submit a claim, at least they know whether they're going to qualify for a benefit or not. Um, and then the second thing is that they'd then be able to apply for that withdrawal via WhatsApp. It will take the member through a number of steps. Um, a lot of them alluding to what Leanne mentioned earlier around is there any potential maintenance orders, divorce orders, um, uh, any types of withholding that we need to be aware of. And um, there will be additional information that we would require from either the member or the employer, depending on that, those answers. Um, and as you mentioned, that will um lengthen the process for that member to access that benefit. So WhatsApp would be our first means in which we want members to um, submit those claims, and there will be an education element to that as well. For those members that are not wanting to use WhatsApp, there will be a member portal, um, and there would be the experience through the member portal that they'll be able to go through the same steps um, and request a savings withdrawal claim. And then for those members that unfortunately don't have access to a smartphone, WhatsApp, or to an uh, internet computer, those members would then uh, submit a manual claim. And then that manual claim can be emailed um, to NNG or the employer could assist with that as well. So we're looking at those three avenues at the moment, um, as I mentioned, in testing phase and I think, you know, those are going to be how you're going to submit it, but then on the back of that, I know we'll chat about it a little bit later, but there'll be a lot of communication and education that will go around that as well. So, um, and understanding what the process will be, timelines, et cetera, but those would be how we'll um, communicate with members. And I think it's wonderful that, that communication and education will be embedded in the WhatsApp yes. um, facility where, you know, if they're requesting a sentence to talk into, they'll be able to see Correct. or be warned about the effects of that Correct. on their time experience. Um, then in terms of two-part communication, what is energy available to assist with communication? So and I think a lot of employers are asking for that at the moment. So we, I think it's, and, and some boards and, and, and employers will obviously take different routes at the moment until they know whether or not this is legislated, but there's going to be written communication, um, there's videos available, we're going to do road shows. Um, and and we, we, I think we need to break it up to your point earlier, and yeah, this is that there's a lot of information, there's a lot of rules, and I think the first point is just maybe the education around understanding what are the three parts, what do those mean, and then focusing around the process around accessing your savings part, what does that mean, and then we can you know add additional communication around retirement parts um, and your visa part as well. So I do think it's important that the, the boards um, communicate and the employees communicate what those needs are, what, what we need to focus on. Um, and with it coming in 1 September, uh, a lot of the consultants are saying to clients at the moment, let's have a three month plan um, leading up until September and we break that communication up in order to advise on members do the education um, that they need. Um, I see that we have, um, a few questions. So uh, what one of the questions is what type of validations will be done on WhatsApp? So I mean, I know you and you've been helping us uh, with that as well. So there's a whole lot of questions from a legislative perspective and documentations that we require. So if you're clicking that there's a maintenance order, um, we will ask for a certain documentation that would then be verified by the fund. Uh, where there's a divorce order, we would ask for a copy of the divorce order, make sure that that's binding. So uh, Shirley's team will assist with that, make sure that that's binding on the fund. Um, and those, those would be the validations. And where there's a 37D withholding from an employer perspective, that engagement we'll try and have with the employer prior to 1 September so we can flag those records. Um, and where they've made any indication, there 
would be a process and it's uh, uh, additional evidence of information that we require to validate it before we can process that um, savings report. Yeah, the other validations that they may be referring to is the validation that you're dealing with a member themselves. And there, um, what NMG is considering is validating the member against existing information that they have on their system, you know, uh, and identifying what that information will be and how many points of information that will be. Plus, they're looking at things like one-time passwords um, and other um, digital um, solutions to authenticating that you're actually the dealing person. with that Correct. the member that you should be dealing with it and it's not a fraud. There was an earlier question before I jumped on to the communication um, and the systems that we're using, but uh, someone has asked, is it compulsory to have monies from the vested pot into the savings pot? Yeah, I think they're asking about seeding there, and the short answer is yes. You do not get a choice. That starting balance is automatically moved. Okay, so... Um, Janice, you were going to look at some illustrations and examples yes. for our members because we know how important it is to make this communication concrete 100%. for members. So I think there's two elements. I mean, you've got the board, you've got employees that are really concerned around members taking the benefit from the fund and what impact that will have on a member's fund credit at retirement, and then versus and a member understand what that impact is going to be. So uh, we've had a few examples that I'll talk through right now. I mean, I think the first one is to talk about, and I know we've shown this slide previously at a previous webinar, but if we if we had to make it out that this is a perfect world and everybody just did the right thing and everyone preserved from the day that they started working until the day that they retire. Um, if we look at the blue line, a member's projected income at retirement would sit at about 1.4 million rand. If we ignore the fact that we have two-part system coming into, um, into the uh, legislation in September, and we look at the gray line, what normally happens currently is, is that members will leave their employer and they normally leave the employer as a result of financial difficulties. And what they'll do is they'll cash in their full benefit, pay the applicable tax and then start saving um, the, the following day. So if you follow the gray line, that individual, when they go on retirement, their expected income is sitting at over just on 400,000. Whereas if we bring two parts into the system and we allow members to access their savings part while they're working, but that they're forced to preserve that retirement part, their income at retirement is between two and three times higher than what it would be if we didn't have two parts. So the orange lines, hundred percent. Okay. So you're targeting just under a million rand. Um, for that individual. So I think this gives some sort of comfort to employers, to boards of trustees, is that even though members are going to have access to their money while they're working, um, there is an increase in terms of projections at retirement. So even if you took your savings, but you're still going to be in a better position Correct. than before that you've got Correct. Yeah. I mean, so even if you to your point here and if you would even with you taking your savings your benefit is only a third lower than if you didn't weren't able to access that savings um so i mean it's a whole lot better than if members at the moment that are resigning and cashing in full benefits you know every seven years potentially so and of course this is the good news janice and this is something that you know trustees we, as trustees we can't just focus on the, on the negative Correct. we need to understand the benefit to members and tell them Correct. So de definitely. Um, then if we look at some examples, and I think this is to the element around communication to members, is that we want members to understand what kind of impact accessing these savings uh, component will have on their um, final benefit at retirement. I have three different examples that I want to take you through. So our first example, we have a member who has 25 years before they go on retirement. Uh, currently have a fund credit of 350,000 rand as at the 1st of September, that would be vested. Um, we assume in this example that the member cashes in their savings pots annually until retirement. So scenario A is, is that when the member goes on retirement, they and, and assuming during their working life, they've changed their employer, but they've preserved their vested benefit what would be the amount uh, at retirement. So we use an example, at retirement would be a million rand. Of that million rand, it is made up of 700,000 rand, which was in their vested pot, which they preserved during their working life. 
they've taken all their uh, savings pots um, uh, amounts, so there's null, and their retirement pot, they've accumulated an amount of 300,000. So this individual, when they go on pension, that 700,000 they can take in cash, and if they haven't used any of their 550,000 tax-free amounts, that would be, uh, of the 700,000 would be tax-free, and then the retirement pot, the full 300,000 would have to be amortized. Yeah, so in this example, your vested pot, you will have some cash there and some that you'll have to invest. That's great. But I see what you're saying. You're saying the only cash you're going to get in this case is whatever you can you take from your vested, vested pot. Because you've yeah. used, you, you used everything in the savings pot. Yeah. In the second example is, is that here we um, assume that the member actually cashed in their vested portion when they left their employment. So when they go on retirement, there's nothing in their vested pot, there's nothing in their savings pot, so they'd have 300,000 accumulated in their retirement pot, which would be um, to be used to advertise. No cash for them. No cash for them. Okay. So, and this, I think, is the important element when it comes to communication and education, is that members need to understand that what this, all the examples that you go through during your working life, when you make those decisions, what impact they'll have ultimately on your retirement uh, when you're on pension. Yeah. So it's not just the amount that's reducing, but the amount that you can take in cash. Reduces. 100%. Yeah. In our second example, our member again has 25 years to retirement, fund credit 350000 as of 1 September, but this member never cashes in his savings spot. So this member is diligent. Um, doesn't look at cashing at any point over their work over those 25 years. What happens at retirement? So again, scenario A, making the assumption the member has preserved their best of benefit when they left employment. They've had the full 700,000 in their vested pots available and their savings pots of 150,000. Now those two pots of cash amounts that they could access and those would be added together and there would be 550,000 that would be able to take tax-free um, assuming that they've never taken any uh, tax free portion previously. Yeah. And then the retirement pot would be amortized. So they would get cash, some cash out the rest of part and their savings part, and then your tax free cash amount would be applied to that. Correct. Yeah. Makes sense. Whereas the second scenario, the um, individual has cash in their vested benefits, so there is no vested benefits available at retirement. It would just be the savings part of 150000 Again, there's a tax-free portion of 550, but this is uh, would be under the assumption that you have 550 mm -hmm. tax-free cash money available. If not, then they would uh, that money wouldn't be tax-free, and you'd have your full retirement part that would need to be amortized. Yeah. In our third example, we're taking a brand new spanking member, joining a fund for the first time on 1 September 2024, age of 20, and this individual would obviously not have a best pot because you're starting afresh, you haven't accumulated any fund credits. In this example, um, the individual takes an annual full withdrawal from the savings pot. So what happens to this individual? There is no money available in cash form at retirement, and what they've accumulated in the retirement pot would need to be amortized. Versus if they um, didn't take any uh, withdrawals from their savings pot, they would have a savings amount that they could access cash um, that would be tax-free up to 550000 and then their retirement pot amount would then need to be amortized. And, of course, this is the intention behind two pot. This is the pure intention of, of it without the funny or the best of pot being thrown in. Right, so this is what the intention is. You need to decide. you want cash before you retire or cash after you retire? Um, yeah, so this example is quite a useful one. To look at. Definitely. Also, we've got some questions that have come in. So one of the questions is, in layman's terms, what is your marginal tax rate? And I think simply is the rate that you get taxed on your salary. I mean, yeah, I don't your know income. There's, there's, yes, there's, there's a little sliding scale. Yeah. Um, and then, will an employee be able to access retirement savings on termination, example, resignation prior to retirement age? No. Um, will members be exempted from two-pot system based on age? Yes, and we do have a whole section around members over the age of 55 on 1 September 2021, which we'll discuss a little bit later, so I won't go into that detail um, right now. And those are the questions that we've got in so far. So, okay. so Jonathan, just on this slide, so for a member who joins on 1 September 2024, we're saying there's no seeding capital no in respect correct. of this. Yeah, so I think that's also important is that new members 
are not going to have any seeding. They will start their savings pot fresh and it would be contributions going forward into that savings yeah, pot. Exactly. That, and they'd have to grow that until they reach the minimum amount. And this, of course, is important for employers to tell um, employees when they're onboarding um, after 1 September. So then we move on. Do members understand they will not receive the retirement pot and perhaps will not receive the savings pot when they withdraw from the bank? So I think some of some of our members maybe saw our slides a little bit earlier. <laughs> we were asked, asking questions before we put them through. <laughs> okay, so we still could talking about communication to members and what it is we need to um, tell them about. And um, while savings withdrawal benefits are at the top of their mind, we also need to expand their knowledge. And this is about withdrawal benefits. So this is now the members actually, their employment is being terminated and they are leaving employment and they're leaving the fund. That's the benefit we're talking about now, your normal Havoina withdrawal benefits. Okay, so here you're gonna have your three parts, a saving part, retirement parts, invested parts. Um, and when you leave, um, employment. You may or may not get an amount out of your savings part. Now it's important that members understand that because they're going to assume hmm, when I leave employment, I'm going to get money out of my savings part. Yes. Okay. But they may not. Correct. Okay. And the rule is a bit complicated. You might have to read this five times because it is quite complex. But basically, the intention is that every member of a fund should only get one. Um, bite at their savings pot in a tax year. Okay, so if you um, have not taken anything out of your savings pot and you get to, um, you're now withdrawing from the fund, then you can take the money out of your savings pot. You can do that. But the moment that you have already taken an amount out of your savings pot, it's a savings withdrawal benefit, and you then withdraw from employment in the same tax year, then you can't take it out of your, you can't take money out of your savings pot anymore. And there's only one exception to that. That is if you have a very small amount left in your savings pot, so you've got below 2,000 rand, then you can take it out. Okay, so basically, Treasury is saying only one bite of the cherry, but we don't want you to leave a really small amount in your savings pot. So if it is really small, we'll let you take it out. Now, I can tell you that the um, Revenue Law Second Amendment Bill has cast some doubt on this. Um, I think we must assume that this will, that, that this is the way it is for now, uh, but we are asking questions because the changes to the Revenue Law's Amendment Bill in that Second Amendment Act um, have cast doubt on this below 2000 access. A lot of questions are flying in on okay. savings, but so the one is, and I know we covered it a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but is there's no um maximum cap on your savings and no. there's just a minimum you have to have a minimum of two thousand rand in the savings pot to be able to withdraw if you've got a million sitting in your savings pot you can draw with one million yeah. there's, there's no cap but that of course is for savings withdrawal benefits and not on withdrawal correct yeah um, the other question that we have coming in is how long must uh, you be employed to qualify for your savings pot? And there's no, it, it was all going to be dependent on how much is in the savings pot. So yeah. it, it, that's, it's not dependent on your um, length of service and no. the employer. On 1 September, everyone gets a savings pot. And then it was, uh, the question went on was, are there any repayments included and does the money get deducted from your salary? So, no. So this money comes out of your savings pot. So there is no money that comes out of your salary for this. There's no repayment required for it. This is just basically the member's way of saving some cash in their retirement fund that they can have access to. They make this withdrawal. There's no putting the money back into fund. Yeah, once they've done a savings withdrawal benefit, you can always do additional voluntary contributions if you want. And a lot of funds are actually encouraging members to do that, to say, if you do take a savings withdrawal benefit, then consider making additional voluntary contributions so that you can make up that money. Yeah. Um, but, but it's not a requirement. And, and even if you've topped it up, you're still left away for the next tax year to be able to access any money in that, um, in that pot. Exactly. And um, another question that came in was, will one March 2021 rules on provident funds still apply, i.e. vested, non-vested, 
yes. all the weights of team of vessel plot overall. So no, so it does uh, so it does apply. So the way to think about your vested plot is having layers. So it's got an annuitization vested layer and a annuitization non-vested layer sitting in the vested plot. Um, so the same rules continue to apply. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we talk about our older members. Okay. Yeah. And there isn't a question on retrenchment, but I know that we have it a little bit later. So yeah. that will let you finish your slides in there. Okay, thanks. So, <laughs> otherwise, good we'll question. <laughs> okay, so savings parts, you may or may not get some outs um, when you withdraw from employment um, and a fund, um, depending on whether you've taken it or not, or not before and how much you've got there. Okay, if you do get an amount out of your savings parts, when you are withdrawing, it's going to be taxed at your marginal rate. Remember what I said? Unless you are dead or retiring, your savings part is always taxed at your marginal rate. Okay. Then from your retirement part, still on withdrawal, on your, from your retirement part, you are not allowed to take anything in cash. So your retirement part, remember, it's stuck there until you uh, retire. So for this one, you can transfer it off to another fund, you can leave it on this fund, but you cannot take it in cash. Not even one third of it, nothing. Okay, and then from your vested part, so this is everything you saved up to one September, this is dealt with in terms of existing rules. Okay, so basically, um, you could take it in cash. Now, after one September, you can take your vested part in cash if you want to. Okay. Um, and that part of your um, your withdrawal benefit will be taxed in terms of the withdrawal lump sum tax tables. And then just something small but can end up being quite important is you can't split your parts. We've got a question on this, so I'm going to just answer the question while, while I'm explaining this. So once you know what you can take in cash share, so that could be your savings part and something from your vested part, once you've taken that cash, the remaining amount sitting in any of your parts, you may not split your parts. So you can't, for example, leave some on this fund and transfer the rest off. They're all the parts must follow each other. But that is, of course, is only after you've taken your cash. Decide what you're going to take in cash, you what you allowed, you take that amount if you decide to, then after that, whatever's remaining in your parts, you either leave on the fund or transfer off. And that would the same apply when they say, if I'm working and I decide to access some of my money in the savings pot, there's still a little bit that's left over, and I leave. Wherever that money gets transferred to, the next tax year, I can access that money from the savings pot. Yeah, as a savings withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to on withdrawal because I've already accessed that money during that tax year. Yeah. So, Janice, I know we had some questions on this. Correct. So, the one was around resignation. So, if a member resigns after 1 September 2024, he would be able to take his vested and savings component in cash. Maybe. So, he can take his vested component, his savings, but he can maybe take in cash depending on the rule on that on the screen now. So, so this question then refers to the APCA um, the communication that was 3 of 2024, and it said paragraph 3.8B seems to suggest that savings component would be subject to tax at a marginal tax rate, while the vested component would be taxed at retirement fund rates. If so, it seems the member could be worse off by having a savings component certainly once the seeding capital is transferred from vested to savings, yes. it will have a different tax treatment. No, exactly, and that's the point, right? They're trying to ensure that if you take money out of your savings part, you're going to be taxed at a higher rate. Because what do they want? They want, so, yeah, they want you to discuss, they want you to keep that there until retirement. And then once you retire, it, it is then taxed in terms of your retirement and lump sum tax tables, and you get your 550 tax free, etc. But while you are employed, they don't want you to take it. Correct. So of course that's why they're taxing you at your marginal rate. So yes. Wow. Yeah. The other question was around retrenchment. So com, uh, communication 3024 seems to be silent on this matter. Bearing in mind um, the comment about around resignation, how do we amend the rules for retrenchment prior mm -hmm. to retirement and what would the tax treat? Yeah, so we, we of course, are um, looking at how all of this impacts rules at the moment. And we're going to talk about rules in a minute. But the point is that retrenchment works exactly like this. No special rules for retrenchment at this stage. 
What's on the slide now applies to retrenchments as well. Um, it may be that um, after 1 September, Treasury has said it will look at retrenchments and perhaps um, it's, it'll consult on whether we need something special in relation to retrenchments. But at the moment, this applies and this is what will be in the rules for retrenchments. So I know some, some people might have joined a little bit late and have missed some of our um, discussion. But how many times may you withdraw from the savings pot? You can only have an, an annual uh, withdrawal in a tax year from the savings pot. And no, the legislation hasn't been implemented yet. The proposed start date is 1 September 2024. Um, can I transfer money from my savings pot into my retirement pot? Yes. And can this be done randomly or once a year? And there's no limitation. It would really just be around the procedure um, and the process that administrator puts in place. So yeah. uh, once legislation is finalised, and I think the administrators can update these systems and understand how all that will work, that communication would be um, communicated to members at the time. I know that we've only got 12 minutes left, uh, Nian, and there's still quite a bit to go through. Maybe we're going to pause on the questions for now. Yeah. And those that you don't answer in the session, we will answer like we've done previously when we send out the recording and the, the slides. So I think that um, in the interest of time, we'll go through what um, is applicable with respect to all the members, and then we'll see what time we have after that. Um, but we do want to talk about deductions and rules a little bit. We'll just see what time we've got. Um, just note that these webinars are ongoing, as is the communication from NMG. So what we don't finish here, we will finish in other form. Okay, so if we look at... Um, older members and what we communicate to them. Um, so we are looking at a specific category of older member. Um, and that category is, sorry Janice, I don't know what I'm talking. That category is, has three requirements, right? The first is that um, you're a member of a provident fund. The second is that you are 55 or older on 1 March, 2021. And the third is you're still a member of the same provident fund. That third requirement um, is also, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion around it at the moment um, because some people don't refer to it um, and there is some anomalous wording in the revenue loss management bill. And my view is that you need to be in all three categories in order to be able to opt in or out, let me see that example, opt in or out of the two-part system. Okay. So, if you fall in all three categories, then you are what I'm calling an older member, and no offense to, no offense to anybody, <laughs> I think I was almost in that category myself. So, um, in that stage, you can elect whether you want to be in the two-part system or out the two-part system. You are automatically out of it, unless you elect to be in it. But the fact that you have an election, Janice means that communication becomes important. And I mean, this is a, a special category, so no offense again, special because to your point, they can opt in at any point into the future. So it's exactly. not a once of communication on 1 September. I do think, and, and the way that we're communicating is that members do need to speak to a financial advisor, understanding all the limitations on if they were to opt in um, and does that tie into what they're planning on doing at the time. And these individuals, some of them might be a few years away from retirement, so it can have a bigger implications For sure. um, on their plans. Yeah, so communication is important, but it might be that advice is needed. Yeah. So as Janice says, they get a once-off election, but you um, can do that at any time. Okay, so you don't have to make the selection before uh, 1 September. They can decide, you know, in two years' time that they want to elect into the um, two-part system. It's up to them to decide. Okay, then um, if we look at the calculation of the amount. So if they elect in two years time that they wanna opt in, then of course they get the seeded amount and they get the pots, right? If, so suddenly they're in the two-pot system, suddenly um, they get the seeded amount. But that seeded amount is always calculated back to the 31st of August, 2024. Now, where the Revenue Law Second Amendment Bill has brought in a bit of confusion is, do you get, as your seeded amount, 31st of August 2024 plus fund return to the date you um, 
opt in, yeah, decide to opt in, or is it you don't include that fund return from 31 August to the date you opt in? And that's where the confusion of the second review laws amendment bill has has been. Up till now, our thoughts have always been that it's 31 August, no fund return. Um, but the second review laws amendment bill has created some um, doubt around that. So we're going to have to see how that pans out. Okay, then um, if you're in the two-part system, then you get your savings part, you get your retirement part, and your contributions from the date you're in are split, right, as it is now. From an annuitization point of view, all your contributions after the date you elect to um, become part of the two-part system, you will lose your um, annuitization special deal, I can put it that way. So when you get to retirement, what will happen is um, you will now have a retirement part and a savings part. None of that amount will be um, vested from an annuitization point of view, but you will still have your vested portion from before that occurred. Okay. So basically, if you're in the two-part system, you're now gonna get some cash while you're still in employment but you get less cash out after it's occurred. Okay. I think that element of advice is important. So, yeah. so important. you've got to weigh up the pros and cons on having access to money while you're working yes. versus waiting until you go on pension. Exactly. And that is where advice becomes so important. Um, so if you're out of the two-part system, then you carry on as normal. Right. Nothing changes for you. Your contributions to the fund continue to be vested from a neutralization point of view. When you get to retirement, you can take everything in cash. Um, nothing changes for you. Okay. So often this question is of should I be in or should, should I be out relates to how much cash do I need now and how much cash do I need do I need when I retire? Yeah. But again, advice is important advice. because because everybody is different. So exactly. your circumstances might be that you stay out. Or yeah. Your circumstances is that you need the money now and you don't want to leave your employer. That you have to opt in yes. and make a short term sacrifice. Of what you're making a sacrifice to go in at the end, but you need that money now. Yeah. So lots of questions around us. We've dealt with it very quickly, but it's actually a very difficult thing to communicate because there's just so much detail. So while communication is important, so is advice for an individual member. Okay, so I think that if we look at um, the amount of time that we've got left in relation to um, what we want to say, I think that... Um, we should perhaps just do a bit of summarizing. Yeah. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Shodi, I think if we could just go over to you first and just can you just give us a short update on where we are the rules? Yeah, so so with regards to the rules, we are required to have uh, our amendments done by one September 2024. But until the legislation is passed, there's really nothing we can do about it. So we've got to wait for the legislation to be passed. So in the meantime, we're looking at the wording contained in the pensions bill and trying to identify um, the specific rules that will be impacted and working on that to try and formulate a template. Um, there is some uncertainty created by the Revenue Law Second Amendment Bill, so that poses a bit of challenges for us. But once we receive the leg once the legislation is passed, then we will be able to submit to the FSCA for approval. Um, and then the FSC has issued communication about the two parts rule incident that happened in February this year. So that's communication three of 2024. And basically what it says is your rules need to contain uh, provisions for the basic workings of the two part system. Yeah. So you've got to have make provisions for your best and non best portion, for your retirement component, your savings component, receiving capital, and as well as transfers from your savings part to your retirement part, your room's got to allow for that. Um, your rules should not just make reference to the income tax act. It has to be amended to cater for the basic workings of the two-part system. Yes, for sure. And um, of course, um, not all rules will be submitted at exactly the same time because we've got to draft those rules in relation to what you have in your existing rules. Um, but perhaps to mention that um, there are a number of things in the communication that, um, you know, are perhaps 
um, we have questions about and uh, NMG will be issuing a dashboard in relation to that um, two-part communication about rules. So look out for that. Um, that is coming soon. And um, we'll also um, issue further communications about the um, Revenue Laws Amendment Bill. So we'll look out for that as well. Um, and that will also deal with some of the deduction issues. Perhaps one of the things to, to deal with, and because I get asked this question all the time, what if our rules are not registered? Yeah, by 1 September. Correct. Okay, now, of course, um, we hope that that will never be the case. Yes. <laughs> but if that was ever the case, and we have plans in place, the energy has plans in place to ensure that. But if that was the case, um, my view, and this is only my view, is that if you do not have your rules registered by the 1st of September, you may not do seeding on the fund and you may not pay savings withdrawal benefits. Okay. And the reason I say that is because the Income Tax Act itself requires you to amend your rules. Okay, so you can't say, oh, well, the legislation overrides the rules. Well, the legislation itself requires you to put it in the rules. Um, plus, I don't believe, and this again is my view, I don't believe the FCA can give you an extension after the 1st of September because um, the FCA cannot give you an extension for a requirement that's in the Income Tax Act. So I think that we've got to be very careful here and ensure that our rules are registered. And I think it's important that boards just take that into consideration that it's going to be a lengthy rule amendment and that the FCA has asked that no other additions to that amendment it needs to be a two-part amendment only. Yeah. Um, and where you have complexities potentially, where you've got DB members, that you stop having that planning discussion around the templates, when, when, will the, when will the board review it, how long will that take to review, review it before it gets submitted to the FCA for registration? Yes, um, so I think that um, we might have time for one question, Janet. Uh, so there was one question that came in and asked um, that I thought was interesting, and I know we were going to discuss a little bit later, was around statements. Will members be getting multiple statements per part? Um, definitely not getting uh, a statement per part. So you'd get one statement that would show collectively your savings part, your vested part, and your retirement part. So you wouldn't get separate statements. Um, and administrators are working on the back end again on how that statement will look. Obviously, from a savings part perspective, there would be cash flows because you'd be exiting, potentially exiting money on an annual basis, and you somehow show it like a bank account and um, money's coming out of that savings part. Um, and I don't think I've had any others. There was one question around divorce. I know we were going to talk about that, but maybe we can quickly squeeze that in. So there was a question that came in um, earlier was, what happens if I get divorced prior to the 1st of September 2024? How does two parts affect me? Yeah, so if your divorce goes over 1 September, then of course you're going to get your parts. And when your divorce order comes through, it will be deducted proportionately from your three parts. If you want a savings withdrawal benefit, the fund is first, and you've, you've got your divorce order, the fund is first going to consider whether or not it's got enough money to pay both. If it has, then it may pay your savings withdrawal benefit, but it will have to ask you that question. Um, so it could affect any savings withdrawal benefit payout. Um, and then I know we touched on transfers, so we did can we confirm and um, actually confirm that the elements of the rule amendment would require for you to allow for transfers and transferring from one part to another part. Yeah, so the FCA communication on transfers is a little bit anomalous. You've got to read between the lines a little bit, um, but certainly um, we would allow the rules for transfers from um, the savings part and the retirement part, no, not much be like savings part, the basic part, the retirement part as well as your seeded amounts, plus when you bring amounts into the fund, you would be transferring part to part. So it would allow for all of those types of um, transfers in or transfers out. I think what we have to mention is that you wouldn't be able to transfer to your savings part. Never. Never, yeah. yeah. The only so transfer into your savings so. part is ever your seeded amount. That is it. So unfortunately, oh, and transfers in from other funds. Yeah, savings, 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 correct. But you can't move money from your vest, more money from your vest, apart to your savings pot because you want to buy that BMW. No. <laughs> <laughs>
So unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for all the questions that came through. Uh, like Leanne mentioned, we will be doing a dashboard that will cover the elements that we weren't able to get through to today. We do do webinars on a quarterly basis, so anything that is still topical that will come up, we will cover it at another session. Think, uh, as a reminder, we will be sending out a copy of today's um, session together with the slides. If I did perhaps um, miss one of your questions, I apologize. We will answer that um, when we send out the communication to everybody that attended. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.